This is going to be an overview of the book of Job. This book gives us five views of suffering. So if you're suffering, this could be the book for you. One view is that Satan is behind the suffering. The next view is that it is a puzzle or a mystery to the one who's suffering. The next one is that sin must be punished, and that's why you're suffering. The next one is that suffering purifies. It makes you better. It makes you a soldier if you use it right. Then the last one is that God allows it so that he can reward those who are faithful during the suffering. Now, the book of Job is most likely the oldest book on earth, even older than Genesis. Written before Genesis, even though it didn't happen before all of the events in Genesis. But to break down the book, you'll see chapters 1 and 2 is a discussion between Satan, the sons of God, and God. Then chapters 3 through 37, you have conversations between Job and his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Then in chapters 38 through 42, you have Job's family and material things restored that he had had taken away from him. So Job is a great picture of the Jews, the Jews, the tribulation saints, in the tribulation time period. For example, his name means one persecuted. And he's on the ground seven days attacked by the devil as the Jews in the antichrist uh, the Jews in the tribulation will be attacked by the antichrist the book of job has 42 chapters matching 42 months of the last half of the tribulation when the Jews will be persecuted if you're looking for something to give you patience then this would be a good book to pick up because it says in James 5:11 behold we count them happy which endure Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So let's get into the book and look at some of the chapters in this book. In Job chapter 1, at the beginning of this chapter, you read about his character and his wealth. Job is a good man, much better than probably any saint you've met. He feared God, eschewed evil, he was upright, and God blessed him with ten children and a large amount of cattle. As it says in Job 1.3, it says his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. So notice that Job was a man who had God in his mind even when things were going good. Do you have God in your mind even when things are going good? And not just when they're going bad. Many times people only turn to God when things are going bad. But Job had God on his mind when things were good. As it says in chapter 1 and verse 5, And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sacrificed them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So notice Job did something for the Lord first thing in the morning what do you think about first thing in the morning the lord or do you think about breakfast do you think about the lord or do you think about video games or movies or tv shows or checking your facebook what's the first thing you do in the morning it should be getting in the bible getting in prayer start out your day with, with god that was job's life on the earth he thought about god he was a great man, a happy man with a blessed life. And at this time up in heaven, you have Satan approaching the Lord, showing that Satan still had access to talk to God at this time. And the sons of God came also. And these sons of God are obviously the angels which kept not their first estate. And Job 1, 7 through 8 says, And the Lord said unto, him, unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? So Satan wants the Lord to remove any hedge he may have around Job so that he can attack him and supposedly show that Job doesn't really love the Lord, but rather only serves God because the Lord is good to him. The Lord wants to prove the devil wrong, so he allows the devil to attack Job. 
Verse 12 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. I learned from this that the devil has to have permission before he can do anything to you. I also learned from this that you don't want God to take down the hedge that's around you. You need to build the hedge up with prayer. And the rest of the chapter shows the devil going to work on Job, taking his property, killing his children. In chapter 2, the devil and the sons of God present themselves before the Lord again. Once again, the Lord brings up Job. In verse 3 through 5 in chapter 2, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, but there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movedest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. So even though the devil took Job's greatest possessions, Job still held fast his integrity and never cursed God through his trouble. Now Satan believes that he, if he touches his flesh and brings him physical pain, that Job will curse God. So let's see what happens. You'll see Satan is going to attack Job's health. In verse 6 through 10, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a posture to scrape himself withal. And he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. So the devil even works on Job's wife, and gets her to be a discouragement to Job. Yet Job never sins with his lips. So we, the, we see the character of Job so far is that he is living for God when things are going good. And now, he's living for God when things are going bad. A lot of people, something bad will happen. Maybe their wife leaves them. Something like that. And many times, they'll turn to drinking. They'll turn to fornication. Things like that. You want to turn to God when things are good. Turn to God when things are going bad. At the end of chapter 2, you're going to be introduced to Job's three friends... And with friends like these, who needs enemies? His three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. In Job 3, Job laments his birth. He says in verse 3, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. And you remember Elijah requested for himself to die. And Job wished he had never been born. I'm sure we've all felt like that at one time, or thought about what it would be like if we were never born. So that's what Job's going through. So you can relate to that. In uh, chapter 4, you hear from Eliphaz, one of Job's friends. And he seems to call Job self-righteous. He seems to believe that Job is suffering all these things because of secret sins. In verse 17, it says, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? That's what he said. If you're a born-again believer, then you know the answer to this question. There is not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not, according to Ecclesiastes 7.20. There is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. And the only way for you to get pure as your maker is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and this will cause God to see you as sinless as Jesus Christ, even though you still sin in the flesh. That's the only way you can be as pure as your maker. But in this flesh dwelleth no good thing, not even in Job. But Eliphaz believed that Job had secret sins. He believed that Job was self-righteous and thought that he, you know, didn't have any sin. And then in chapter 5, you have a continuation of what Eliphaz says to Job. And he says this great verse, Yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. So just as sure as the sparks go upward, it's as sure that you're going to have trouble. You might as well get right with God before trouble comes, like Job already was. 
And in Job chapter 6, you have Job's reply to Eliphaz. And he says in chapter 6 and verse 4, For the arrows of the Almighty are within me, the poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. So Job was a righteous man. As the Spirit of God told us in chapter 1, however, Job is still flesh. And when you're in the shape Job is in, you aren't yourself. Verse 14, it says, To him that afflicted pity should be showed from his friend. To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend. But he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. So when you see a brother going through trials and tribulations, don't kick them while they're down. Job said to him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend. So are you showing people pity? That are going through something, the Bible says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, weep with them that weep. Are you enjoying hearing somebody got fired from their job? Are you enjoying hearing that they lost a loved one? Are you kicking Christians while they're down when they got off into sin? To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend. So Job seems to be explaining to Eliphaz that he doesn't have some type of secret sin going on and that. He should, uh, Eliphaz should be showing pity. Now Job 6, 28 through 30. Now therefore be content, look upon me, for it is evident unto you if I lie. Return, I pray you, let it not be iniquity. Yea, return again, my righteousness is in it. Is there iniquity in my tongue? Cannot my taste discern perverse things? So Job is pretty much defending himself here. And in chapter 7, Job continues to speak and you see, hopelessness in his words he says in job 7 7 oh remember that my life is wind mine eyes shall see no more good so life is so short the book of james says it's a vapor here job compares it to wind it comes and it goes and it's forgotten even a great wind like a hurricane they give hurricanes these names but still if you weren't living during that time or in that area you probably don't even remember it or know the name Know all the names of the hurricane. And remember that your life is like that. It's like wind. Now Job 8, you have Bildad speak, and he believes that Job should repent. In Job 8, 3 through 6, it says, Doth God pervert judgment, or doth the Almighty pervert justice? If thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away for their transgression, if thou wouldest seek unto God be times, and make thy supplication unto the Almighty, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee, and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. See, he thinks if Job is living righteous and doesn't have some type of sin on him, then God would be prospering him. But you, that's not always the case. Now in verse 9, you're going to have Job's reply back to Bildad. You see, these are, most of the book of Job is Job talking to these three so-called friends. And in Job 9.20, Job says, If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. And he says in verse 33, Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that they that might lay his hand upon us both. You see, now we have a daysman betwixt us that's the lord jesus christ in job 10 job continues to speak and he has a plea to god and in verse 18 he says wherefore then hast thou brought me forth out of the womb oh that i had given up the ghost and no eye had seen me which again he was wishing that he had died as a baby or never even been born to begin with that's how much pain he's in after losing everything and the boils and everything else Job 11, Zophar begins to speak, and he tells Job he deserves worse. Which is, which in a sense is true, we all deserve, deserve worse. We all deserve to be in hell. In Job eleven six, it says, And that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exact, exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. So he basically says, Job deserves worse which is true of every man. But he's saying it as if Job is worse than others. It's true that we deserve pain, suffering, death, and hell. But God's grace gives us something we don't deserve. 
which is eternal life, and his mercy keeps us from something we do deserve, which is hellfire. And Zophar says in chapter 11 and verse 7, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty into perfection? You couldn't search to find out the deep things of God with a search engine. His ways are past finding out, says Romans 11.33. There's things about God that you're not going to know until you get the mind of Christ, when you get your glorified body. In Job 11.8 it says, It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do deeper than hell? What canst thou know? So Job's friend knew about hell. It's deep. It's down in the heart of the earth. Isn't it something that the oldest book in the world mentions hell? Yet people don't believe it today. Job 12, you see Job's reply. And he's pretty much saying that the Lord hath done this. Job 12, 9 through 10 says, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? So although the devil is the one that's attacking Job, it's still the Lord. The Lord and the devil are working so close together that sometimes you can't tell them, tell them apart. The de God will use the devil as a rod to chasten men. He'll use the devil as a rod to test men, and that's what's happening with Job. And in Job chapter 13, even though Job knows that the Lord has allowed these things to happen, he still trusts in the Lord. And he says in Job 13, 15, the great verse, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job continues explaining how death comes soon to all. In Job 14, 1, it says, Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. It really hit me in the past year how fast time is going and how we aren't promised another second. And how we need to be using every second wisely. And how we need to leave something behind to give glory to God, to help somebody else. And in chapter 15, Eliphaz accuses and believes that Job does not fear God. We know that to be untrue because in chapter 1 it says Job does fear God. When you're going through hard times, a lot of people will say bad things about you, kicking you while you're down. They did Job the same way. In chapter 16, you have Job's replies and talks about how his friends are miserable comforters. In Job 16, 4 and 5, it says, Also could speak as ye do. If your soul were in my soul's stead, I could heap up words against you and shake mine head at you. But I would strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. So even if Job was sinning secretly, and the Lord was judging him because of that. His friends would still have the wrong approach. They should be saying something to help him, to strengthen him. You know, you need to restore someone in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If you see an, uh, another Christian down, even if he really has sinned and he's been punished because of that, you should still try to restore him, pick him back up. In Job 17... Job continues talking, wondering, and he, he says in Job 17, 1, My breath is corrupt. My days are extinct. The graves are ready for me. Job 17, 13, and 14, If I wait, the grave is mine house. I have made my bed in the darkness. I have said to corruption, Thou art my father. To the worm, thou art my mother and my sister. Nobody's went through what Job went through. The back and forth with Job and his three friends goes on through chapter 32. And then in chapter 32, you see Elihu on into chapter 37. In Job 32, 1 through 3, it says, So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakal the Buzite of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled, because they found no answer, and yet had condemned Job. How it, now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken, because they were elder than he. So 
Elihu's younger. He's waiting on them to speak. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And in chapter 33, Elihu continues to rebuke Job. In chapter 34, he has searched God's justice. Chapter 35, he condemns Job. In chapter 36, Elihu talks about the greatness of God. He says, Behold, God is great. In verse 26, Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. And then in chapter 37, he talks about the majesty of God. He says in verse 23, Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. Now, in chapters 38 through 42, you're going to have God talking to Job. You had Job talking to his friends, and now you're going to have God talking to Job. In chapter 40, Job promises silence and admits to the Lord that he is vile, just like you need to do. Admit to God that you're vile, just like you've done if you're saved. You knew that you were a sinner, and, and, and you deserved hell. It says in Job 40, verse 3 through 4, then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. In chapter 41, you see one of the greatest chapters on the devil. And the chapter is about Leviathan, who is king over all the children of pride. And I, I have a whole study on that, so I won't get into that too much. But you can clearly see in Job chapter 41 that Leviathan... So... The Lord gives Job double what he had before. Just like the Jews are going to get double what they had before. But this has been a great book. The book of Job. I hope that this will help whet your appetite for this book. It's one of the greatest books in the Bible. A great book to go to for wisdom. If you're going through something hard in your life, it's a great book to go to. See how Job handled things and he... You know, he didn't give up on the Lord, even though the Lord was bringing all that on him. So just read this book, get comfort from it, and we'll get into the book of Psalms next week.